My name is Mauro Zapatera, and I'm a physician. Uh, I did my MD, PhD at Harvard Medical School. Now I have a private practice in physical medicine and rehabilitation in Pasadena, California. I'm also working with the Los Angeles VA healthcare system. And I've been trained in polarity therapy, Reiki, and craniosacral therapy as well. So I try to integrate all the trainings that I've had and try to care for patients. And physical medicine rehabilitation is a specialty that um, essentially tries to optimize human functioning in whatever you may have. So if it's a painful elbow, we try to either decrease the pain or help you with movement of the elbow. If it's a spinal cord injury, we try to help you with any of the, what we call activities of daily living. So that's, you know, washing your face, brushing your teeth, going to the bathroom, uh, dressing yourself, stuff like that. How can you optimize your function to live your life and increase your quality of life? So sometimes we need to use medications. Sometimes we might need to do surgeries. I don't do the surgeries myself, but I usually, you know, I'll refer to somebody. Um, sometimes they might need some therapy, like physical therapy or occupational therapy. Sometimes they might need something more energetic, like Reiki or craniosacral therapy. Typically, if, they, if I feel like they need something more uh, energetic, if I feel like there's sort of some um, existential suffering that's occurring that, let's say, uh, unfortunately can't be dealt with in the amount of time that I have to deal with them, I'll actually refer them to other people um, and I refer them to my wife, usually, who does craniosacral therapy. So the CSF stands for cerebrospinal fluid. And um, I did my entire PhD dissertation on this fluid at Harvard Medical School. And Essentially, the way that it came up was that, um, believe it or not, I thought that I wanted to do research on cancer. And I was in a cancer lab, and I was not so happy, let's say, in the cancer lab. And my wife says, she comes to me and says, uh, you know, I don't think you're very happy doing what you're doing. I think you need to sort of shift. Let's take a, some, a break. And so we took a break and went to Santa Fe together, and she wanted to study polarity therapy, which is a holistic healthcare system. And in one of the classes, uh, we were learning um, some craniosacral techniques. And the teacher said, uh, you know, you're working here with the cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid is one molecule away from seawater. And I said, well, that's interesting. Like, seawater is an interesting, you know, compound. We have this fluid inside of us that's one molecule away from seawater. So that night I go home and I start kind of reading up on the cerebrospinal fluid. And I realized that there was very little known about this fluid very little known about this fluid. It was thought of sort of providing a couple nutrients um, and sort of buoyancy and protection to the central nervous system. So as we go throughout the training of our, our, our polarity, um, you know, I'm starting to think about going back to Harvard to finish my PhD or to actually to start it. And so I left all the cancer stuff behind and started a lab that was able to actually investigate the question, what is the cerebrospinal fluid? And so in us, in all of us, we have 150 mils, milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid in our brain, inside of our brain, covering the outside of our brain, within the central canal of our spinal cord and around our spinal cord. 150 milliliters is equivalent of almost like half a, a, a can of Sprite or Coca-Cola. Every day it turns over about three to four times. So that means you make 500 milliliters which is half a liter of cerebrospinal fluid a day. So we're all making this fluid and it's bathing our entire brain. It's bathing all the insides of our brain, the outsides of our brain. The central canal, the spinal cord actually has a central canal that is bathed completely with CSF all the way down the spinal cord. And the CSF goes and it actually goes all the way outside the spinal cord, all the way down to the sacrum. So what we want to do is essentially ask the question, you know, what does the cerebrospinal fluid do? And so we did some experiments. 
we were the first to analyze uh, very, very uh, descriptively human embryonic cerebrospinal fluid. And we compared it to rat embryonic cerebrospinal fluid. And the reason why we did that was because I looked at some sections of some embryos. And I saw that in these sections, the cerebrospinal fluid space, the space in these sections was ginormous. It was huge. But the developing brain was this little tiny sliver. And inside was this huge space. And you know, I actually turned to my colleague and I said, you know, there seems like there's something missing here. And, 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 and he goes, well, no, that's actually, you know, that's where the choroid plexus is, which makes the cerebrospinal fluid. And I said, wow, all that is fluid? Well, what does that do? So first we wanted to analyze what were the, you know, what actually was in the fluid. And then we wanted to see um, what does a fluid do from a developmental perspective. And so we kind of did some experiments where we, mitched, we, 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 um, we mixed and matched certain sort of developmentally staged brains with different developmentally staged CSFs to see what does the CSF actually provide to the, to the developing brain. And interestingly, what we found out was, well, first of all, you know, just anatomically, every single neural stem cell in development, which, is, which, are the cell, which are the cells that develop into neurons to create the entire central nervous system, every single one of those stem cells at one point in development makes contact with the CSF or is contacting the CSF. So early on in development, you're actually making contact with the, the, these cells are making contact with the CSF. There's various cues and growth factors and molecules that are actually released into the CSF that instruct the developing brain on proliferation. How much do I actually need to expand, for instance? Um, differentiation. When should a cell that's a neural stem cell leave the sort of niche that it's in and go out and become a neuron? So it can function, it can have a more specialized function. And so we essentially categorized the embryonic um, cerebrospinal fluid in humans, as well as we did an extensive analysis in, in, uh, in, in, in rats, looked at all the proteins, looked at how they changed and varied with time, and what were some of the functions of that. And what we published was essentially that the cerebrospinal fluid creates a, a niche for stem cells and provides information based on the molecules that are actually in the cerebrospinal fluid, provides information, information to the brain for proliferation or differentiation. And so that was kind of our major, you know, that was kind of our major uh, finding with, uh, with, with my, my PhD work. So in back of that then was, you know, all this kind of interesting training from polarity therapy and craniosacral therapy of this fluid actually having sort of a spiritual component. And during my PhD thesis, one of the books I read was actually the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying by Soigal Rinpoche. And he actually describes this practice, it's a, it's a POA practice, and it's done, um, you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a Buddhist meditation practice where uh, you, essentially it's done at the time of death, and it's transferring one's consciousness to the unified Buddha consciousness. And there's a couple sort of indicators that you are successful in the practice. One of which is a tingling at the top of the head. Another one is headache. Uh, one is a small little hole appears on the top of the head where a, a blade of grass can be put into it. The other one is a softening of the fontanelle, uh, which is, which is where the where where all the bones of the skull come together when we're when we're when we're babies that's there's sort of a space there and you can actually push on it and that's actually you're pushing on the cerebrospinal fluid and so in, in when somebody dies that space actually softens and um and you might have a little bit of clear fluid that actually comes out from the from the head and so i said wow is that cerebrospinal fluid you know if this is a successful practice of transferring your consciousness to the buddha consciousness and one of the indicators of success in that practice is a clear fluid that emanates from the top of the head could that actually be cerebrospinal fluid because that's the only clear fluid that's present at that so uh we actually tried a little bit to get some fluid from practitioners who did this practice and we weren't able to do that um but um you know, those thoughts were kind of in the back of our, 
of, 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 of at least my awareness and consciousness when I was doing this work. Um, combined with sort of my craniosacral training, you know, it became a very powerful, it became a very powerful fluid. And I started doing, uh, with, my, with the guidance from my wife and some of my teachers and stuff like that, some meditations on the cerebrospinal fluid. So for instance, you know, just anatomically, you know, um, we have a third ventricle, which is essentially like right, like if you go ear, you know, mid ear length, straight line, and then uh, midline, right in between your brow, there's a fluid filled space. It's in the midline. It's called the third ventricle. Just in front of the third ventricle is the pituitary gland. Just in back of the third ventricle is the pineal gland. Okay, both those glands are contacting the, the third ventricle. This third ventricle then opens up. It goes up into the lateral ventricles, which are on either side of the brain, and it goes down all the way the central canal of your spinal cord. Okay? In kundalini yoga practices and traditions, they describe a hollow canal in the center of the spinal cord where the kundalini rises and essentially brings the, you know, the awakening of the kundalini or this primal energy to the third chakra where then it goes up to the crown chakra and an awakening occurs. The caduceus, for instance, is the midline. So the staff of the caduceus is sort of like a, a, a midline. And the two sides of the caduceus are depictions of three of the channels or two of the channels from this yogic practice, which would be the pingala on one side, the right side, ida on the other side, the left side, and they cross. And at each crossing with the shashumna, they make a chakra. The meeting of the heads, which are the heads of the serpent, come together at the midline and they come right at the third eye. In my belief, the heads of the snake represent the, uh, one head of the snake represents the pineal gland, the other head of the snake represents the pituitary gland, and the center is the shashumna, which is the cerebrospinal fluid. When they come and meet together, it's sort of this meeting of the three energies right in the center here. Uh, you know, the third eye, sort of the eye of the soul. Um, this place has been called the Crystal Palace. It's been called the Cave of Brahma. And so from that space then, um, it, is, it, is, it is my belief that, you know, and, and, and some other people's belief as well, that there may be a physical manifestation of the sensation of I am, our beingness, at that space, when these energies come and combine, that we have this sort of sensation of beingness. And the reason I say that is because the I am is a fluid. The I am can transmit, or excuse me, the, um, the cerebrospinal fluid is, is, is a fluid. The fluid is known to transmit light. It can transmit vibration. It can transmit flow, so flow from the fluid, and it can even translate molecules. So if there's sort of uh, an experience of a unified experience that you're having, the cerebrospinal fluid bathing all the areas of the brain that it bathes has no synapses that it actually has to go through. If a certain message, let's say, is dispersed throughout the fluid. It can go to all the major control centers of the brain. It can be done totally non-synaptically, and it can be have this whole synchronized effect on the brain because it's sort of, it's bathing the entire central nervous system. The you know, let's say the guiding light from this talk really, you know, for this talk really came from talking to you and Maurizio, who stated that, you know, I was talking to you about the fluid and you said, well, you know what Nisargadatta said about this fluid. And I said, no, I don't. And he said, well, you know, he said, the fluids come together and the sense I am appears. And I think instantaneously we kind of looked at each other and said, Maybe that's the cerebrospinal fluid. And so that's exactly, that's exactly what, you know, what I'm talking about is sort of when this, when this sense, when this, when there's a sense of I amness, when this sense arises, when that inner sense of beingness arises, it's, 
my experience that it sort of sense I sense it in my third ventricle or my third eye, and then from there it sort of gets into this expansion, sort of transmitted through the fluid to my entire central nervous system, of which I, it's just a complete holistic feeling of my sense or the sense of beingness. And so that's in essence my that's in essence the the talk that I give, branching it from you know here's the anatomy, you know as simple as that might be. We have a fluid-filled space right in the middle of our brains that has this fluid. We have a, you know, we have a we have a we have a, we have a canal that goes down the center of our, our spinal cord. And when you look up, you know, Shashumna, it sort of describes a hollow canal down the center of the spinal cord. Um, you know, it can transmit information. Um, if you look at uh, flower essence essences or the the work of uh, Masuro Emoto, who looked at, you know, how does how do fluids store and transmit energy. So here is a fluid that can, you know, store, even if we're just looking at a molecule, you know, oh, it's storing the molecule and it's transmitting that molecule to another source, you know, or to another space being transported via the CSF. It's, it can transmit light, it can transmit vibrations. Um, and in, you know, in my, in, 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 in my talk, I use sort of melatonin as an example because melatonin is synthesized by the pineal gland and it's synthesized by the pineal gland. Uh, it's mostly synthesized, it starts being synthesized when the sun goes down, and it helps us sort of induce a state of sleep. So that's already an altered state of consciousness when you actually fall asleep. So here's this, you know, here's this gland, it starts secreting melatonin. There's really good research out there that suggests that the melatonin actually goes into the CSF, and the CSF then distributes it to the brain so that we slowly fall asleep. Interestingly, DMT, which is dimethyltryptamine, is also synthesized in the pineal gland. Rick Strassman found it in 2013 and published a paper. And DMT is used in many shamanic practices to sort of induce um, you know, altered states of consciousness, as well as it's believed to be hypothesized to be released endogenously during birth, death, and during lucid dreaming. So, you know, if there's these molecules in the CSF, like melatonin, that are being, you know, released into the CSF and then distributed to have this sort of global experience of an altered state of consciousness like sleep, could then the CSF store and transmit energy from, let's say, a source energy, transmit that energy to our beingness, to our sense, to ourselves, and allow us to experience our sense of self, that pure beingness within us, and be aware of that. So that is sort of the essence of, you know, kind of the views of the CSF that I wanted to present to Sands. So the structure of the CSF can change on, based on nutrition. I feel like it can change based on exercise. Um, it can change based on, you know, traumas. So people are, you know, they're always asking me of, well, you know, I have a concussion, you know, what can I do? Um, we know that the CSF is changed if there's a stroke or a bleed, you know, sometimes the blood might actually get into the CSF. Um, but even just in your sleep, for instance, you know, just by, as, you've, as you go throughout the day, you know, even if you look at something like melatonin, for instance, it's like this, you know, it's, let's say you wake up, okay, it's a nice, you know, and then if you collect CSF, CSF, and then around seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night, it starts to increase in your, in your CSF. It increases for about six hours, and then it starts to decrease in your CSF. So that's just one molecule that we've looked at closely. In development, what's interesting when we looked at in development, because we were able to take, let's say, like embryonic day seven and embryonic day 10 and embryonic day 15 and 17 and, you know, newborn and adult rats, for instance, and see how does it change. Every single protein we looked at was different. It was like, you know, we had some proteins that came up early and then went down. We had some proteins that actually came up late, you know, were only, were mostly present in the adult. We had some proteins, for instance, that stayed very constant. And so, you know, we're very interested by obviously the ones that are, that are, you know, that are changed. It's like, wow, you know, we saw just like a little blip for two days. You know, what's happening in the brain during that 
little blip. And that's how we kind of went back and said, you know, is this a major part of neurogenesis or, you know, where, where, where a lot of the neurons are being made? And so what we found was specifically there was one molecule. Again, you know, we're always kind of breaking it down into molecules, but we found one molecule that changed. It had a little blip, you know, and we looked specifically at that time point and we saw that that was a major time point for the majority of the neurons to be developed, to be, to be, um, to be developed. And so, yeah, so it's changing all the time based on, you know, what you're doing. Um, you know, so, you know, the best thing I can say is, you know, you try to live healthily and so you have a healthy CSF, you know, you exercise, eat good food because all that's going to actually change what you're, you know, what's present in the, in, in the CSF. It's in constant flux. You turn it over three to four times a day. So you're constantly making new fluid. Um, and you know, if you look at the sides, if you look at like, you know, the CSF comes and it contacts the ventricles. If you look at the cells of the ventricle, for instance, these have, these are, these look like little hair-like projections. They, they, they have hair-like projections on them, which are called cilia. And these cilia can actually beat too. So these cilia can kind of create a movement in the CSF. You know, it's like, and there's experiments, for instance, where they've taken, you know, a rat, they, they opened up, you know, the, the, a rat ventricle and they put a little dye or a little bead on one side and they wait, you know, a few minutes and all, the dye has migrated all the way to the other side. Or, you know, the bead has actually, has actually moved because these cilia are kind of beaten, you know. So just kind of imagine here's this fluid filled space, the, the, you know, here are these fluid filled spaces in our brain that is moving, is constantly in movement, right? That transmits, it can transmit light, it can transmit movement and vibration, it can transmit molecules and growth factors and ions and, and, and hormones. And it's constantly moving, it's constantly in flux. It goes all the way from, your, from both sides of your brain to the third ventricle, which is right in the middle contacting both the, pi the pituitary gland in front and the pineal gland in back, going all the way down your spinal cord in the middle. So in the middle of your spinal cord, on the outside of your spinal cord, all the way down to your sacrum. So if you can kind of imagine this fluid, you know, bathing this whole area. And then you, once I do that, I sort of connect into my, my, like my, the fluid nature of my being you know, and just connect in there. And, you know, the thing that I'm, exp that, that I'm interested in is when I sort of bring up, you know, the cerebrospinal fluid or, um, you know, when I, when, when I talk about it and I have people connect in with their own cerebrospinal fluid, what is, what is your experience of it? How do you experience the fluid nature of yourself once you kind of get a sense that, wow, there's this fluid in my, you know, there's this fluid in my brain. It goes all the way down to my sacrum. You know, does it have any qualities for you? Um, and so I'm very interested in, 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 you know, your experience, because I have my experience, but I'm very interested in, in everybody's experience. When, you know, once they kind of connect in with the fluid, how does that, how does that help them? Um, and is there, you know, is there some sort of relationship between uh, the fluid field of the cerebrospinal fluid and the heart? You know, and so what is that relationship? Um, and that's something that I'm sort of personally investigating myself. Uh, even with our PhD work, for instance, I was very fortunate to be in, in, in Chris Walsh's lab who, uh, you know, he had funding to do these projects because it took a lot of work to actually do these projects. Um, and, you know, who would, who would allow themselves to have a lumbar puncture done while they're in a deep state of, med, uh, you know, of, 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 of meditation or, you know, something like that. Some of the projects that, for instance, we're looking at is, you know, even Rick Strassman, for instance, trying to find DMT in the, in the CSF, very difficult to find one molecule in the CSF because there's so many other 
molecules that are larger and there's so much more quantity. So when you're looking for one, it makes it very challenging. And as better techniques get designed to actually look for those little small molecules that actually just come at moments, you know, just a tiny little moment, um, you know, how do we find that one, that one? So, uh, you know, something for instance, like, um, you know, even studying the process of dying, you know, we really have very little information, but I know that now people are starting to look at, well, what is the neural activity in the brain that's happening during death and then at death? And how do we, you know, how do we, when do we say, when do we say death? Um, could we actually go and, you know, unfortunately we do these, uh, we do these studies on, on animals, but, you know, can we go during a moment of, of, of death and take the CSF, you know, and see is DMT actually, um, uh, you know, is there a higher concentration at that time? Um, and, you know, those are things where essentially you need funding to do those sorts of studies. But, you know, we tried looking like I was describing the POA practice in this Buddhist, you know, we tried finding anybody that would, you know, but you just kind of imagine, you know, trying to set up a scenario where it's like, well, you know, was that a successful POA? Oh, yeah, here's the, you know, can we go in, collect a little bit of this fluid just to send it to this laboratory so that they can analyze it? Um, but, you know, that's what we would love, you know, from my perspective, I'd love to know, you know, what is that clear fluid at the top of the head if a POA practice is actually successful? Um, does it have any constituents that are similar to the CSF, you know? Um, or is it more like salivary, you know, uh, fluid or something like that? Um, but it's also experiential, you know? So how are you, uh, when, when, when you, you know, when you meditate on your third eye or when you meditate on your third ventricle, what is your experience? Where do you feel the energy? Do you feel energy? Um, do you feel anything building? Do you feel any movement or vibrations occurring? You know, do you feel any subtle movements or, or subtle energies in, 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 in your sacrum? Um, do you feel an expansion? You know, do you feel a contraction? Uh, and those are kinds of the things that, you know, it's like kind of building up personal stories from people and saying, well, this is what, you know, this is what people's experience are of it. And, and you know, going from there. So they are trying to look for receptors for, you know, DMT and, and stuff like that. Um, one of the reasons I believe, you know, I think you can inhale it, you can snort it. Um, one of the reasons I think some people actually prefer, regardless, it's going to get to your brain. And, you know, I don't know how the distribution is when you actually ex exogenously deliver it, but it's going to get to your brain somehow and that's how the effect is. Um, in the inhalation process for like, you know, snorting it, there are actually, uh, the cribriform plate is this bone that sort of comes out and in coming out of the cribriform plate is actually your olfactory nerves. And so it's the one place where you can actually penetrate the blood brain barrier. And so people are actually trying to get, you know, therapeutic molecules into the CSF using intranasal sort of, you know, intranasal approaches. So I'm using an intranasal approach to actually get to my brain faster via the olfactory nerves that are open, that there, there's actually a sort of a, an opening in the, in the blood brain barrier at that area, and you can get stuff into the CSF. And so what they're looking at is how do we encapsulate these, these, the, these possible, you know, therapeutic medicines so that it, because it has to travel through, you know, up the, essentially up the nose through the brain material, you know, through the brain tissue into the CSF because that's, really that's really the only way we know how to get into it. Or, you know, can we take something like eat it and it goes through the blood and then it gets into the, into the, into the cerebrospinal fluid. So I'm not, quite, you know, I'm not quite sure on that, but um, you know, the other way is obviously, you know, putting a shunt, they call it a ventricular shunt, you know, and going right into the, the ventricle and change, you know, we can do that in, in animals. Um, in terms of changing the, the, the properties of the CSF and seeing what this molecule does or what this molecule does. In terms of uh, whether or not the 
cerebrospinal fluid is one molecule away from seawater, it turns out that it's not because we have a lot of uh, other proteins and hormones and growth factors that are actually present in the cerebrospinal fluid that aren't present in seawater. However, uh, and this is fascinating to me, evolutionarily, when people have looked at the evolution of what they call the CSF contacting neurons, so these are the neurons that are contacting the CSF, okay, when they look at something like the starfish, for instance, or, the, or an eel, what they find is that the same neurons that contact the seawater in a starfish are the evolutionarily the neurons that are contacting the CSF in humans. So therefore, could you see the, the CSF as sort of our internal ocean that evolutionarily developed that we are monitoring the ocean, and so that's the ocean within. So that's the fluid. And they're actually they're calling them the CSF contacting neurons are contacting the seawater in a starfish is contacting the CSF in us. So we have this ocean. We essentially have the ocean within us. Every drop is the same. So. That to me is the you know that to me is the beauty of this fluid. Continuously sort of investigating it and you know picking it apart and sort of looking at it closer and closer and farther and farther. Mm -hmm. <laughs>